All right. Hello, everybody. Good morning. And as Leon said, thank you for joining us today as we commemorate uh, the 159th uh, Battle of Hampton Roads that did take place right here in Hampton Roads, Virginia. Uh, we here at the Mariners Museum uh, house a lot of the artifacts that are brought up from the USS Monitor Rex site, uh, which is located right off of uh, Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Excuse me here. I'm trying to do some light screen adjustment on my end. Um, so we take this opportunity every year around this time to, to commemorate the events that took place and explain why this battle and the outcome of it was so important to not just the, the area we live in here, but navies throughout the world from that point forward. So let me, um, hang on one second. Let me just do that. There we go. Apologies for a little bit of technical glitch as we get started. So we're in the, in the middle of the American Civil War around 1862. There's a Union blockade of naval vessels along the southeast coast that's preventing import and export of goods to the southern states, also known as the Confederacy. Um, so the Union's got their biggest, best, and brightest ships kind of cutting off the supply line for the South. At this time, wooden vessels are still the primary use of ships in the Navy. Stephen R. Mallory, who was shown here, Stephen R. Mallory, who was shown here, he was the Secretary of the Navy for the Confederacy. And he recognized something very early on that would kind of be a game changer for how the South would strategize. I have here one of the primary sources from a book we have in our collection. And these are his words. These facts are presented for your consideration. I regard the possession of an iron armored ship as a matter of the first necessity. Such a vessel at this time could prevent all blockades and encounter with a fair prospect of success their entire Navy. If to cope with them upon the sea, referring to the Union ships, we follow their example and build wooden ships, we shall have to construct several at one time, which for the South was not very easy to do, especially if their ability to receive supplies was limited, if not cut off completely. For one or two ships would fall an easy prey to her comparatively numerous steam frigates. But inequality of numbers may be compensated by invulnerability. And thus not only does economy, but naval success dictate the wisdom and expediency of fighting with iron against wood. So Stephen R. Mallory and several members of the Confederacy cabinet proposed to get an ironclad. Um, they're unable to get one from Europe, so they wind up building one themselves. They dubbed the name the CSS Virginia. Um, my apologies again as my screen keeps freezing here. Let me see this. There we go. Sorry about that. So March 8th, 1862, we're going to see the beginning of what is called the Battle of Hampton Roads. The ironclad ship called the CSS Virginia is going to go up against all of the wooden ships of the Union blockade along the Chesapeake Bay coast in the James River and the Elizabeth River here in Hampton Roads. Now, up until this point, when you had a wooden vessel against a wooden vessel, it was a fairly even match. However, one ironclad ship was able to destroy about a dozen Union vessels in just a matter of hours. Most of them, they were um, sunk to the bottom like the Cumberland here. Others like the USS Congress here were blown up one ironclad ship was able to do all of this. So basically they proved to the point that one iron vessel would do much more damage against numerous wooden vessels and it was an advantage in their favor. But that brings us to March 9th, 1862. This is where history is going to change. On this date, the two ironclad ships shown here, the CSS Virginia, and the USS Monitor go head to head. This is the first time in history two ironclad ships go into battle against each other. 
at the end, it's a draw with neither ship doing any significant amount of damage to the other vessel. But what it did was kind of mark in history that wooden ships of the Navy were no longer going to be efficient. And this was a turning point for navies all across the globe. Here's a sign. It's in Willoughby Spit Point here in uh, uh, Virginia in the Hampton Roads area. And it just talks about how it opened the era of the armored warship. And then a map of Hampton Roads over here kind of showing where the battle was going to be taking place. So here's where the Cumberland was sunk in that first image, the Congress that was blown up and a dozen other ships that were destroyed by the US, uh, the, excuse me, the CSS Virginia. Now, ironclads were not necessarily unique at this point, but this is the first time, as I mentioned, that two ironclad vessels are actually gonna go head to head against each other, thus proving that they are the future of navies everywhere. But how did we get to this point? This idea of better constructed, better defensive ships and vessels. What was the evolution like? And that's what we're kind of gonna look at here. We're gonna kind of start back at some of the earliest ways ships and uh, cultures tried to protect themselves when going into battle at sea. Shown here is a Viking vessel. It's a model from our collection. Uh, and what you may notice and you may have seen in movies, uh, television shows, even books or YouTube videos, that a lot of times the Vikings would line their shields on the outside of their ship. Not only was this useful for leaving more room inside the ship for the men and their supplies, or the men and women in some cultures, it also added a very light but extra layer of defense for artillery such as arrows that were going to be fired at them. So it's very, shown very early on that even rudimentary ideas of protecting a vessel at sea from your enemy was already being thought of. And as we move a little further into the ancient world, we have here a Roman trireme. Uh, this type of vessel was used by several uh, ancient cultures, including the Romans, the Greeks, and several other ones. I'm going to step over here to point out that typically um, the main action used on these ships was the ram there. They were used to drill a hole in the ship of their enemy, thus sinking it down to the bottom. This is very similar to what the CSS Virginia did to the USS Cumberland. It rammed, it, rammed a hole in it thus causing it to sink to the bottom of the river. Now, with the Romans, there is, uh, we have evidence that they did line the hull of their ships with lead plating. However, it's usually understood that this lead plating was used less so as a defensive action and more so to prevent ships that were at sea for long periods from, uh, would uh, wood eating uh, sea boring uh, worms that would kind of they were like the termites of the sea, so to speak. So they would kind of eat away at the wood causing a lot of damage and when you're at sea or if your ship is in the water for extended periods, you need a protection against that. So there's no definitive evidence that that lead lining was used for defensive purposes, but there is a possibility that it could have added that little bit of protection like I showed with the Viking ship just previously. Now what the ancients did used to do and kind of moving into the medieval era was they would line their ships with animal hide soaked in vinegar. Now that's an unusual technique uh, but there was a reason behind it and that's because around the seventh century of the common era a new weapon came about that was extremely devastating, and it was known as Greek fire. Greek fire was essentially a, an ancient slash medieval flamethrower of its time. Uh, it was a combination of, and I'll show you an example of how it works, but there was a flammable liquid, quite possibly an oil mixed with other things, um, that would just cause devastation to ships. And it was used by the Byzantine culture in particular. And what it would do was exactly, uh, just basically destroy any vessel that would come into sight. 
Now this technique of a of Greek fire was already being used on land against invaders trying to come into Constantinople, uh, but they found a way to use it at sea. And that was through a mechanism called a siphon. So shown here, you can see that the flammable liquid is in a tank. It's being pumped through or siphoned up here through a series of tubes. And as this flammable liquid makes its way, it's gonna come out to a point where a fire was waiting and then it would projectile out. Thus, again, kind of showing you that example of being an early form of a flamethrower. Again, it wasn't necessarily the fire that was devastating, although that was, it was the flammable liquid that was used. And the funny thing about it is historians to this day do not know what the kind of secret recipe was of comp that composed this flammable liquid. Um, they think it's a mixture of things like coal and, and other kind of maybe petroleum, but there's no evidence and there's no written uh, legacy left of what the actual recipe for this Greek fire was. So again, those animal hides would have been soaked in vinegar because it said that Greek fire could typically be extinguished by two things. Basically water was useless against it when trying to put it out. But two things could help prevent the spread of Greek fire. One of them that I mentioned was the vinegar. The other was urine. I guess desperate times do call for desperate measures. Uh, so you do have options there. Hopefully you have some vinegar on hand. Uh, if not, there's all, always option number two to go with. So this new type of artillery of sorts was a game changer. And so that animal hide soaked vinegar was just another example on how ships were always trying to defend themselves against the artillery from their enemy. Now, from the medieval age into the Renaissance period, there's not a lot of evolution on um, ship design in terms of defensive measures. One of the first examples of an armor clad ship is going to be the Santa Ana here. And I have a description because I love primary sources that talk about the, uh, the Santa Ana's look. So it said the Santa Ana's leaden armor plates were attached to her bolts of brass and it said for her she could resist the artillery of a whole army. And at that same time could sail a row as any of her unarmored contemporaries. She was a big ship with six decks, a reception saloon, a chapel, a specially constructed powder magazine, a specially constructed powder magazine, and a bakery. Um, now I'm sure this wasn't a typical fancy bakery where you can get little macarons or anything like that. It most likely was a mill where you could bake bread and keep the men fed while at sea, but still a really, really unique uh, element to include on a ship, especially a, a war vessel. So the Santa Ana was used in the early to mid uh, 16th century. Um, it was sheathed in lead and bolted together with brass, uh, with brass bolts. So again, this is kind of like the first example of an armor clad ship, not necessarily an iron clad ship. Now the Santa Ana actually went into battle. It was used by the Spanish in their capture of Tunisia around 1535. However, none of the sources that I looked into said whether or not the lead sheathing, the lead plates on the Santa Ana were a added, uh, were that much useful, much more useful for protecting the ship. It is said that the Santa Ana was very useful in capturing the city of Tunis, but it never mentioned how well the lead plates held up to any of the cannon fire, musket fire, anything like that, that was kind of being shot against it. So I'm not entirely sure if a lead plating was that beneficial. 
the Spanish continued to line their ships in lead. And again, this is lining the hull of the ship, not the same way that I mentioned the Romans did to protect, to protect against those uh, sea worms. But a couple other, uh, we have evidence that Great Britain lined some of their ships with lead, but not for very long. The Spanish did it for you know a, a couple of decades. But I'm assuming it wasn't that best of a defensive feature as not too many other nations took on this type of tactic. So still a great example of how we're moving into a more modern era of protecting our ships with an element other than wood. Now we move into the Venus Belli, uh, which is Latin for end of war. Uh, the ship also has another name, Fin de la Guerre, uh, which is its French name. And we're still in the 16th century. We've moved a little later. And we have an image here, a print kind of showing what this ship was. And because, as I mentioned, I do love uh, primary sources, here is another description of what this ship looked like. Um, or not, three, pardon me. It was a large flat bottom craft with a central casemate or battery built of thick balks of timber and plated with iron. So we have an example of our first ironclad vessel here. It was intended to be and very likely was impenetrable to any artillery that the Spaniards could bring against it and in hopeful anticipation that their ironclad ship would raise the siege and put an end to hostilities. The men of Antwerp christened her the Finis Belli. So some background, we are in the middle of the 80s year, 80 years war. Uh, the Dutch are trying to fend, fend off the Spanish invasion to their, to their land. And so the Spanish Armada, we hear a lot about the, the British Navy, but the Spanish Armada was not a force uh, that you wanted to mess with either. And they kind of showed that and proved that during this period. So the Dutch decided to build an ironclad ship in hopes of being able to gain the upper hand during this battle against the Spaniards. So the question is, with this revolutionary ironclad ship, we're in the 16th century, this is almost 200 years uh, before the, the Civil War, or just, uh, just under 200 years. So why don't we hear about this ship and how it may have been a game changer for navies everywhere? That's because, unfortunately, the ship was very heavy and had a deep draft. And if you know anything about ships, as in shallow water, as soon as they launched this ship, it sank. It basically ran aground, I should say. Uh, it was stuck. They couldn't do anything with it. It didn't even make it to the battle. It literally stalled on its way. It was then easily captured by the Spanish who kind of kept it around just to, to study it. And they kind of made fun of it, quite honestly. Um, and long story short, the Spanish were able to over, overthrow the Dutch and, and remain uh, having a stronghold in that area. So. I still wanted to point it out, though, as just how far back, or really not that far back in some ways that you think about it, that ironclad ships are already being conceived in the minds of Europeans. And this really was maybe a game changer, unfortunately, because it didn't fare so well. It didn't really catch on the idea of ironclad ships. Um, the wooden vessels of the time were still faring perfectly fine in war, so there wasn't really a need for change at this period. But that is coming soon. Before I get into that, though, one thing I do want to point out, this is one of, I think a lot of us here at the museum love this model. It's called the Kobuksen, and it's uh, got a maybe more familiar nickname, the tortoise ship or turtle boat. And this is actually a Korean vessel. As uh, we are talking about European ironclads, it's very important to note that Asian cultures were also uh, messing around with the idea of an ironclad ship and actually using them in their navies. So we're about the same time period as the Phoenix Belly. And um, if you look at the ship here, I'm gonna kind of point out some of its features. So you can see where it gets the name tortoise ship or turtle boat or the nickname. 
Um, on top, we have a couple inches of iron plating and it may be hard to see, but also along the top, there are rows of spikes here. And that is because, so the Koreans were trying to fend off Japanese invaders. They had about three to six of these in their fleets. The numbers may vary depending on the sources. Um, and these spikes on top were to prevent their enemies from boarding. If you did not know these spikes were here, which oftentimes you would not, you would attempt to jump on board the ship and then you would essentially become impaled. So this is a really good example of just artillery and use and one of the earliest examples of ironclad ships. It's also typically agreed by a lot of scholars that a lot of Asian cultures were regularly using ironclad ships before Europeans more regularly adopted them into their navies. So this was a very important ship to the Korean navies and played a great role in fending off that Japanese invasion. Just wanted to throw in that aside as we continue looking at how Europeans uh, came into their own in terms of an ironclad ship. And one of the reasons behind that was very similar to what I talked about before regarding that Greek fire. When you've got such a devastating weapon, you have no choice but to find ways to defend yourself against it better than you are. Or if you're not defending yourself against it, you need to find a way to do it. At this time, ships were usually just made of thick layers of wood, which with a normal cannon uh, or normal artillery would obviously have some devastation to it, but not in the way that would come when Henri Joseph Paisson, he is French, came up with the Paisson gun. And basically what he did was make it capable for using explosive shot at sea. Just to give you an idea, you've got uh, at this time about two different types of shells that you're being able to use. You've got just your standard uh, cannonball that was just a, basically a piece of iron or other material and would fire through the hull of a ship and leave a hole, leave a hole, um, maybe cause a little bit of devastation, but then we move into explosive shot. And what that does is think of it as a kind of shotgun with like the buckshot. It was designed to leave a lot of shrapnel and debris. And this was a game changer for wooden ships. So the way this worked, these were already being used by uh, artillery such as howitzers on land. And the problem with using it at sea is that it required a, like a kind of a high arch shot at a low velocity. And you really needed cannons at sea to kind of shoot a little lower because you're aiming for, you know, the hull of the ship and maybe some of the lower decks and everything like that where the men would be defending. What he was able to do was include a timed fuse in his cannon that was facing the front. And what would happen is when the cannon was fired, it would set off a chain reaction. So you've got your timed fuse up here. It kind of, think of it like a, a wine cork, so to speak. It's kind of plugged in there. It's gonna have a fuse and then you're gonna have like your gunpowder and everything in here. So that chain reaction is gonna come. Light this fuse the cannon's gonna be firing, 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 flying through the air. This fuse is gonna be going down. And hopefully if the timing is right, it's gonna impact with the ship. The gunpowder is gonna cause a, an, explosive, an explosion. And all of these lead cased balls, your shrapnel are gonna go flying everywhere. So when on impact, it's really gonna cause like all of this debris, and when you think of a wooden ship, if you've ever seen movies, especially Pirates of the Caribbean is a great one, you just see all of that wood splintering, flying off, causing just damage and destruction, not just to the ship, but also to the men who are nearby that, um, uh, that firing. So this again was a game changer that really made shipbuilders and navies of the world say, mm, okay, well, we definitely need to, to do something about that. 
what this did, and I have a quote here from John A. Dahlgren, who we're going to talk about in just a minute. They did several trials in Brest, France with the Paisson gum before it was used on naval vessels, the French ships, I should really uh, clarify. But um, Joseph Dahlgren, who was also an artillery uh, man himself, wrote three, these three things. We have a book in our collection and he notes what these experiments that were happening in Brest really were going to mean. Here's three things he wrote. <clears throat> it is evident that this kind of artillery is most destructive. Number two, the Naval Commandant at Brest forwarded a report to the minister wherein it is said that the weapon proposed is capable of producing a prodigious effect and will introduce great changes in naval affairs. Last but not least, they are so productive of damage, referring to the Paisong gun here, they are so productive of damage and fire in the common shipping. Another result will be the adoption of iron vessels or of some proof against artillery. So it's very clear and very quickly understood that there is going to be a need for change just with the creation and development of this single weapon. So John A. Dahlgren, uh, an American ordnance artillery man himself, uh, he, while he was impressed by the Paisong gun, also understood it had it fallacies. It wasn't perfect. Um, and here's what he said of that gun. Paisson had so far satisfied naval men of the power of shell guns as to obtain their admission on shipboard. But by unduly developing the explosive element, he had sacrificed accuracy and range. The difference between the system of the Paisson gun and my own was simply that Paisong guns were strictly shell guns, so those explosive shells that I was uh, mentioning and showed an image of just prior, and were not designed for shot, nor for great penetration or accuracy at long ranges. So this goes back to what I was saying about uh, the howitzers, you know, requiring kind of a, the right angle and the right speed on land, but it wasn't as easily done for ships at sea. John A. Dahlgren fixed that problem and he created his own cannon called the Dahlgren gun. So here's an image of it here. And John Dahlgren is over here. And then there's a cannonball in our collection, an example of explosive shot. I just really love that item in our collection. It's, um, you can see how old it is. It is about Civil War era and everything, but just wanted to kind of show where kind of like the fuse and everything would have been. So John A. Dahlgren develops this gun, um, and it was designed, as I said, to shoot not just the explosive shell, but also solid shot when needed. So I guess two is better than one in this case. Um, and he was able to do that by making it a little thicker, a little heavier. This thing was about 9,400 pounds. Um, so you definitely want to make sure you it is bolted down and, and strapped down when it's not being used. And when it is being used, be careful due to that recoil. Uh, it can easily kill a man or injure him very gravely. So not a force to be reckoned with. But so Dahlgren was able to make this happen. And this is the type of artillery that we're going to be seeing a lot more of as we go into the Civil War era. But I just wanted to point out these examples of how artillery is really kind of the force behind a lot of these evolutionary changes as far back as the ancient days, all the way up as we move further into the 19th century. And here are just some great representations of Dahlgren cannons in our collection. Um, this one over here is in our Defending the Seas gallery. Um, and you can see an example of, this is kind of a mock-up of the turret that was used and where the cannon was situated. 
We also have Dahlgren cannons, the Dahlgren guns from the USS Monitor. And we recently actually, our conservation team underwent a project where they did some cleaning to it. They drained the tanks, they bore down the middle um, and you know, gave it a nice good cleaning and thorough overview in hopes that eventually one day this will be able to go on display. If you ever get the opportunity to visit the Mariners Museum, if you haven't already, there is a viewing area where you can see this and other items like the turret from the USS Monitor on display as they are undergoing conservation. And then here's a great image from our collection showing the turret. This is the USS Monitor ship and the turret, and then once again, where that Dahlgren cannon was. So with this, we are officially into the age of iron. Now it's gonna happen fairly quickly. I think the, the Paisong gun, as I mentioned, really was a strong indicator that things needed to change and things needed to change fast because any ship that's going to be able to harness this technology of ironclad is going to be on top. And just like with the Paisong gun, the French did it first. An image here is the Le Guar, uh, and it was a French vessel. It had a wooden hull sheathed in iron plates about 4.2 to 4.7 inches thick. This is by known by historians as the first going ironclad ship. Now, the Laguar was decent side. It is a broadside ironclad, and that's in reference to the fact of the fighting style happening at this time when ships would kind of be stacked, you know, parallel to each other and then fire back and forth. And that's kind of indicated by this row of cannons here. And they actually took out a deck of cannons. They only left one row so that the iron sheathing could cover, you know, as much of the hull as possible. And I would love to have a model of this in our museum. This is a model of the Laguar from the uh, National Marine Museum in, or Maritime Museum in France. And you can kind of see here where those iron plates are gonna be bolted on, again, most likely by uh, brass bolts. And again, those plates are going to be just shy of about five inches thick. Now, the Laguar didn't necessarily really see any action. She didn't really fire her cannons, um, as they say, in anger against anyone. Uh, but it was known by other nations that this ship was out there. And if it were to be attacked, it more than likely was going to be able to defend itself much more easily than the wooden ships of its time. So not to be outdone by the French, the British of course came in and we then see the HMS Warrior. It's about 60% uh, bigger than the uh, Laguar that we just saw. And I didn't point out the date, the other date um, for the Laguar was 1859, this is 1860. So in Europe, all of this is happening as tensions are kind of building in the United States across the pond. Um, but it's everything's happening so quickly at this point. And the HMS Warrior was also a broadside ship, very similar to the Laguar. It had uh, its, its thick wooden hull uh, sheathed also in about four to four and a half inch iron plates. So this development, this rapid development and construction of ironclads is just proving that things are changing. Things are moving quickly. And I would love to get the opportunity to go to Portsmouth, England, where the HMS Warrior still rests. Again, this ship went up against other wooden ships, um, but in more so skirmishes versus like full on battles. So it was able to showcase its strength and its prowess, but it, it really, it still earns its place in history um, because at the time the Warrior was built, right after the Laguar, it was the biggest, best, brightest ship on all of the seas and oceans anywhere in the world. And it is now a museum in Portsmouth, England. I will add it. I, If you've seen my programs, I talk about things I want to add to my bucket list all the time. I have like 10 buckets and they're all overflowing at once, but I've got to start somewhere. Um, so you can visit this 
uh, and learn more about the history of the HMS Warrior. If you're, you know, as things open back up and we can travel, I, I believe the museum just opened back up this past me, uh, December uh, for visitors. So definitely something to, to keep in mind and a great just modern interpretation to something so historic and a great visualized uh, visual representation of history. And so this is just an example of an Italian ironclad showing that, as I mentioned, other nations were starting to develop their own navies of ironclad ships. A lot of these early on were more so um, floating batteries, so to speak. They were used mostly for harbor defense. So they weren't really going out into open oceans or anything like that, which is why I think many of them didn't see that much action. Although this ship, the Re d'Italia, an Italian vessel, um, jumping forward a bit, was actually commissioned in 1863. And um, so that's about a year after the Battle of Hampton Roads. It went up against some um, Dutch and Austria-Hungarian fleets and uh, was sank at the, the Battle of Lisa. Uh, there's more to that story. I didn't really want to go too far into it. I more so just wanted to show an example of how other European powers are using these more and more in their navies. And the United States knows this, which is why Stephen Mallory initially tried to go to Europe and buy an ironclad ship for the Confederacy. Unfortunately, no one would sell one to him. I mean, why would you really want to give up some of your best technology to help, you know, somebody who may or may not be your enemy to fight a war that doesn't involve you? Hence why the South was kind of resigned to develop their own ironclad ship. But, oh, uh, sorry, got a little ahead of myself. So jumping back just a little around 1842 is an example of the United States also trying to incorporate this ironclad machinery and vessel into their, um, into their ships. The Stevens battery was developed by Robert and Edwin Stevens. Their father who fought in the war of 1812 actually came up with an idea to have one of those ironclad floating batteries. Uh, unfortunately, he didn't get the funding he needed by Congress and nothing ever happened. But around 1842 is more and more of these whispers of new technology, the Python gun and everything. There was an understanding, as I've been saying, that something has to change. So Robert and Edwin went to Congress, asked for money to build an ironclad vessel. Now, they received the money, they received the funding, they received the approval from Congress. So this is 1842, 20 years before the Battle of Hampton Roads. What happened? What happened in that 20 years? Well, for one thing, as I've been saying throughout this entire program, technology was changing faster and faster, and they were struggling to kind of keep up with it. They kept changing the designs and the plans of how the, the ship should work and how it should function, how it should look. In about 1856, Robert Stevens passed away. And then in 1861, we see the start of the American Civil War. Edwin Stevens tried to keep pressing on, but Congress rescinded the funding as the money was needed elsewhere. So unfortunately, they were um, railroad tycoons. So they had the money and Edwin did continue on. Uh, however, by the time they got their ship ship shape and ready and out there. The Battle of Hampton Roads had already taken place. And um, it was about 1863 once they finally got all of their um, stuff together and everything. So I do have one other note. So Stephen Mallory was writing um, a letter to Jefferson, the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. This letter is dated May 10th, 1861. And he actually points out the notion of the Stevens battery in his letter. So this is about 19 years later. And he says, the resistance of iron plates fixed upon an unyielding surface to the direct action of heavy ordnance was first fairly tested by Mr. Stevens of New York in 1845. And the results of his experiments proved that wrought iron plates one inch thick 
thus supported could not be penetrated or injured by shells and that the same iron six inches thick resisted all shot at every distance. So nice little shout out, so to speak, to the Stevens battery uh, by Stephen Mallory nearly two decades later. But the USS Monitor is noted for you know being a part of history but it's not the first ironclad in u.s history that note and award goes to the baron de call um it was built and commissioned and initially used by the u.s army beginning in about uh 1861. it was then outfitted in its a uh, uh, mississippi steamship it was used in the mississippi river area now it did see some action. Again, it was mostly more of a floating battery and it saw and defended itself against more so smaller wooden ships and mostly land attacks and such. And it was defending a lot of the area for the Union against the Confederacy, which is maybe why it doesn't get the full recognition of being the first US ironclad that it should. But the Baron, Baron de Cobb was formally called the, the St. Louis. It was commissioned by the US Army initially. And around 1862, it was then commissioned into the US Navy. This is all happening around January 1862, right around the same time the USS Monitor is being launched for trials um, up in New York. So just one of those things that I do try to point out to people is that the USS Monitor, while known as the ironclad that changed history, it wasn't the first in U.S. history, and more importantly, it, neither the ironclads of uh, Virginia nor the Monitor were the first in history at all. And with that, we kind of circle all the way back to the Battle of Hampton Roads, where for the first time in all of this, two ironclad ships are going head to head against each other. So again, the USS Monitor here, and the CSS Virginia, and as a note, uh, it is often called the Merrimack as well. We here at the Mariners Museum do try to refer to it as the official uh, Confederate state ship Virginia because that is what its name was during the time of the Battle of Hampton Roads. And from this point on, everything that people already knew that wooden ships were pretty much going to be obsolete from this point was proven this day uh, back in March 9th of 1862. And then from that point forward, navies around the world were iron. So a nice brief evolution. There's so much more to this um, that I just wasn't able to cover due to time constraints, but there's a lot of history behind the evolution of ship design and ship defense, the reasonings behind it, all of the trials, the, the successes, the failures, there's just so much to it. And I think it's actually not a topic I was very familiar with until last year's Battle of Hampton Roads. And the more I looked into it and did the research on it, it just became more and more interesting and fascinating to me. And I hope you enjoyed the presentation as well. Again, there's so much more history behind all of this stuff that I covered here today. It's just a tiny fraction of what's out there regarding the evolution of ironclad vessels. And before I take a minute to, I think we have enough time to, for some questions, um, which I will do my best to answer. I wanted to point out um, a book here. I have it here with me. Um, this book kind of goes on and picks up from the point that I left off uh, today. It starts with LaGuardia and talks a little bit more about um, how ships continue to evolve from the LaGuardia, the Monitor, Virginia, Battle of Hampton Roads, and further on. I personally got it from Amazon. It was only about 10 bucks. So if it's something you're interested in, it's just a great little factoid with great pictures, charts, stats about the ships and, and so much more. Um, and then some information about us here at the Mariners Museum and Park. Uh, my personal email, if you have any questions about today's presentation that you either uh, don't think of until after the fact or just wanna know more or I can help in any way, 
please do not hesitate to email me at this. This is my personal address. Um, and as we begin to open our galleries back up, which we hope to be soon, come and visit our USS Monitor Center that I mentioned. You can see so many artifacts related, not just to the USS Monitor, um, but ironclad ship evolution and the Civil War as a whole. And um, just a, a great exhibit, great gallery, a lot of really impressive things to see. And then last but not least, a lot of the images that I use today and in most of my presentations are from our collection. You can learn more about what we do have uh, if you visit catalogs.marinersmuseum.org. Um, and then you can just visit marinersmuseum.org to learn more about us here as an institution, what we have to offer and our role to fulfill our mission um, in that we are all connected through the waters. And with that, um, I thank you all for your time. I am going to pass it back over to Kira and Leon. If um, there are any questions that I can answer, I will note I am not a full scholar on this subject matter yet, but I can um, definitely answer as many questions as possible. Oh, that's not true. You know everything. Ah. Um, we actually only have uh, time probably for just a few questions, okay, maybe great. about five minutes or so. Um, and then we're going to be getting ready for the next program, uh, if you have registered for that as well, uh, that takes place at 11. Um, but we do have uh, a few questions here, Kira, or sorry, not Kira, uh, Erica. <laughs> oh, uh, one she of them can answer them was, if you'd like. <laughs> um, is it true that the CSS Virginia only carried shells and had not carried solid shot into its battle with the USS Monitor? If I remember correctly, yes, it did not have solid shot um, against, well, no, that's incorrect. I believe it did have shot because there was some damage done to the um, iron, uh, the, the cladding of the, the monitor that uh, wasn't necessarily from the explosive. And that was the purpose of having those dog ring guns, which the, uh, the Virginia did also have. Um, I, I don't believe it used just explosive shot, uh, explosive shell. I do believe it used solid shot as well. Um, but I, I'm honestly not 100% sure on that, that. But they did have those Dahlgren cannons, which means that they were capable of using both, which is why I, I'm pretty confident that they did have the use of both during the battle. Hi, Erica, just to pop in, um, yeah. Lauren was actually um, with uh, Eric Generet, and he um, was able to answer that question. Oh, great. Um, so Lauren said there's controversy about whether or not she carried bolts, um, which were armor piercing rounds at the time. She pretty much just carried solid shot. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Thank you. Sure. And we had one more question here. Um, uh, from Dr. and Mrs. Betts, they asked, uh, many of us learned about the first encounter of ironclads as the battle between the Monitor and the Merrimack, yeah. like the bridge tunnel. Currently, mm -hmm. the names Monitor and CSS Virginia are used. Was the Mariners Museum instrumental in making the correction to reflect the correct naming? I would like to think we did. Um, when the USS Monitor was raised and, uh, not raised, I apologize, um, when a lot of the artifacts started coming up from the monitor and brought here to the Mariners Museum, especially with the turret, we really did become a voice for that story. And we do our best here at the Mariners Museum to point out and differentiate between the names. The reason for anybody who may not um, fully understand why there's that interchanging happening, the Merrimack was originally a wooden ship. It was sank at the bottom of the Elizabeth River. Um, the, everything from like the water line below was fairly preserved and the Confederacy raised it and used that as the hull for the uh, ironclad. Now the Merrimack was a USS ship that was sunk right at the beginning of the Civil War. It was renamed the CSS Virginia by the Confederacy and that's where those two names kind of go back and forth. We do our best, as I said, to recognize its place as the Virginia here at the Mariners Museum. However, if, if you do call it the Merrimack, um, it's, it's still, at least half of the ship was still part of the Merrimack. So it's not completely wrong. But yes, for any Hampton Roads uh, fellows out there, the Monitor Merrimack Bridge Tunnel is essentially where this Battle of Hampton Roads was taking place if you are not already uh, familiar with that little tidbit of knowledge. 